Let me begin today by reading a Taylor Rooks tweet. Taylor Rooks is a broadcaster for TNT. She's on the, their NBA coverage. She does a podcast with Joy Taylor. Taylor Rooks has tweeted out something scolding Emmanuel Acho, who had the audacity yesterday on Fox Sports to scold Angel Reese who did all the whining and crying after losing to Iowa. I've got death threats. and Oh, my God, people just don't know I've been sexualized. And uh, Emmanuel Acho uh, called out Angel Reese appropriately. Angel Reese defined herself as a villain and invited being the villain and wanted to play the role of tough guy until she got beat. She talked smack to the UCLA coach. Watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Remember, you know, remember that? Watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Then when she loses, is nothing but tears and feels sorry for me. So here's what uh, Taylor Rooks tweeted at Emmanuel Acho. Respectfully, colleague, the disappointing thing about this take is you actually can't have an informed opinion on this if you're choosing to be gender neutral and racially indifferent, because that is impossible. Her existence as a black woman shapes both how she is seen by others and how she sees the world. And in this case, how she is seen by you. Your response here is actually full of opinions that indirectly and directly involve both race and gender. It's just coded to unsuccessfully soften the blow. You have to ask why Angel became the villain. You have to ask why her role as villain has not allowed her to also be human. You have to wonder why her being asked a question and simply answering has led to this level of discourse. You have to ask what you mean when you say Angel wants to talk groan or pose groan. What is grown a substitute for? You have to ask why trash talking, a practice many athletes engage in, is seen so much harsher when it comes from someone that looks like her. You have to ask how some of the ideas you express fuel the fire of the aforementioned marginalization. You have to ask why your head, why you heard her discuss unacceptable treatment and your reaction was to discuss how she can't address it. And I have to ask you, if you spoke to any black woman, athletes about their experience in order to give a more enlightened take before you came and said this, Angel has absolutely made herself a public figure and she should be open to the criticism pertaining to her game and persona. She should also be allowed to express when those criticisms are out of bounds. Why did you cling to her reaction as opposed to the vitriol that caused it? She certainly does not deserve sympathy for losing a game. She deserves sympathy for being attacked and targeted for things outside of said game. As much as you believe this to be a take without bias, your reasoning proves the point you are fighting against. Opinions are opinions. Everyone is entitled, but, but our opinions are shaped by the paradigms we know. I hope no one says they are taking out gender and race because in a black woman's world, we do not have that choice. I hope you realize your luxury and privilege by being able to say what you said. I hope you look around and notice the people that have delighted and applauded seeing a black man get on television and give this opinion on a young black woman because it's, because it's not for the reasons you think. That's my take. It's exhausting. These angry, mad, opportunistic, lying black women, they're exhausting. What, what Taylor Rooks is doing She's being an overseer. She's telling, she could have eliminated much of that word salad.
she could have eliminated 98% of that word salad and just said, hey man, you don't, you can't state any opinion about black female athletes without the approval of black women. This is the mentality of the matriarchy. And this is how they oversee black men. They threaten them. They disrespect them. And the, the threat here is obvious. Oh my God, black women, look at Emmanuel Acho. He's outside uh, the limitations and the boundaries that we have set for black men. How dare he correct, criticize, question a black woman without a black woman approving of it beforehand? What other group of people are policed this way? their thoughts policed this way by their women. This is insulting. This group of angry feminists and the simps who support them, they have to be stopped. This is important on multiple, multiple different levels. It has to be stopped because it's inappropriate for the culture and for Developing a properly run society, male leadership is necessary. But even if you just take it to sports, these angry black women, these lying, entitled, angry black women, they're going to destroy what Caitlin Clark and women's basketball accomplished this year. They're going to turn it into the victim Olympics. And no one's going to want to watch that. When Caitlin Clark goes away, so is most everybody else, including Taylor Rooks and all these other angry, opportunistic, lying black women and their simps. We're going to get into detail on the diary of mad black women and their simps today. Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I'm Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Wednesday. Thank you for joining me. We have an awesome show. Shamika Michelle is going to join me shortly. Uh, TJ Moe is going to join me as well. Talk about a different aspect of this. Anthony and Virgil will be here for some Tennessee Harmony. We'll talk about uh, Trans Day of Visibility with Anthony and Virgil. Uh, but we're going to spend the meat of the show talking about angry black women and how they're policing black men, and how black men have to quit being simps and quit going for this, quit allowing them to police us in this way. Taylor Rooks, Joy Taylor, and these other, Jamel Hill, these other people I'm going to call out today, they don't know what they're talking about. They've been installed and placed in these positions under the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion initiative. They're not qualified. So all they do is talk about victimhood. That's how they trend over Twitter. That's how they get their name out there, by screaming racism. That word salad I just read from Taylor Rooks. D d is anyone going to ask Taylor Rooks or ask Angel Reese? Just be Angel, oh, I'm a victim. And I face, you just don't know the harassment I face and the death threats. Proof. Proof. As journalists, that's our job. Anytime anybody makes an accusation, hey, can you provide me some proof? It's great. We, we've got your word, but could we get some proof here? Because again, it's like, oh, I've been sexualized. Well, everybody's offered up the proof that she sexualized herself. We're journalists. We're not supposed to be activists. We're not supposed to be paid liars. And again, when we say things as stupid as I'm about to go into detail here, showing you what others have said, we need to be challenged in real time. And so is any of this based in facts, in logic, in reason, in actual real life events, or is it just your feelings? And building a world around your feelings is inappropriate. Today's show 
This episode is brought to you by our good friends at Good Ranchers. Fall in love with beef, chickens, and seafood all over again by subscribing to GoodRanchers.com. Use my promo code FEARLESS to get $150 worth of free chicken wings for a year plus $20 off with your subscription. Thank you, Good Ranchers. You guys make sure we're supporting Good Ranchers because they allow me to do what I'm going to do today. Uh, I, I, I want to... Because it's, you know, Taylor Rooks' tweet infuriated me this morning, but a lot of this is being driven by uh, Joy Taylor, who was on FS1. I, I happen, I'm just going to keep it real here, I happen to like Joy Taylor. Perfectly harmless, uh, you know, well-intentioned. But again, when you get placed someplace and, and, and you're forced to participate in conversations with men, you get out over your skis and, and you start forcing things. Hey, I got, what can I say controversial? What, what can I say uh, to make, my, make a name for myself? What can I say to trend on Twitter? And you just start saying stuff and you start throwing a racial card around. That's the way you do it. I'm being a thousand percent authentic. I like Joy Taylor, but there's some things I'm going to have to say here that will be a bit tough. You guys know I keep it real. African Americans always trying to prove how black they are. And again, anybody that's listened to this show, anybody that knows me, knows I have no problem with interracial dating. I have no problem with African Americans. But do they have a tendency to go overboard trying to prove how black they are? Absolutely. And particularly, if they spend any part of their life married to a white person, then they go really overboard. I've said it, and, I, and, I, and I'm not lying when I say it. I like Joy Taylor. I get what's driving her. I don't like what she's doing here. I want to play this clip of Joy Taylor yesterday uh, talking about Angel Reese and the blowback that Angel Reese has gotten ever since she, we played it yesterday, her little post-game uh, comments about, oh, my God, nobody knows the troubles. Oh, God, the death threats, everybody. Oh, I haven't been happy. Oh, God. And the tweets, the mean tweets. Oh, oh. <sighs> they're going to ruin this whole basketball thing. That, that, that Iowa's... Uh, LSU game, 12 million viewers. What's going on in women's college basketball is phenomenal. These angry black and African American women and their simps are going to destroy it. This is going to be a one off because the people that are going to benefit from Caitlin Clark and what she brought to the table. They're going to destroy because that's what they do. They destroy everything with their victimhood mentality, with their sense of entitlement, with their laziness and lazy takes. Play Joy Taylor. Why is she a villain? Because of what she does on the court? She said she was. Who made her the villain? She said she was the villain. Self-proclaimed. Who made her the villain? Because someone made her the villain, and it wasn't her. She was being herself. Mm and bragging the same way that all athletes brag when they win, when they, when they hit a big shot, when they do this. I've, I've seen it a million times. Yeah. But we don't talk about them the way that we talk about Angel Reese. Mm. So it's very easy to say that we're just gonna eliminate the fact that she is a young girl and eliminate the fact that she is a black girl and eliminate the fact that she's an unapologetic black girl. We can take all that out. I love playing the we don't see color game. We don't see gender game. Let's do that. Do we talk about men who brag after winning or hitting a big shot the way that we talk about Angel Reese? I'll clear it up for you. We don't. We don't do segments about that because it's very common. We're used to seeing it. It's, it's absorbed differently. Mm -hmm. There's an expectation of how Angel Reese is supposed to act. The reason we know that is because of the reaction that we got from her. And we, when, when she did that to Caitlin Clark last year, people didn't like it. Men do that all the time. Joe Burrow, we could pull up so many clips of men doing this, this, and this, and so this, and this, and this. What about the more taunts to, to other players, though? 
All men do this. All, do, no, all, no, they do, no, no, all no. these players do it. I, we don't Hold have on. enough time to do these segments. We will be here for the rest of our we lives. Got long, we got a long A block. Because we, because we don't the, have enough time so, to pull up all the clips of all the men I'm not bragging. saying that, but I'm saying it. So everybody, you are right. Everybody shows up, showboats show and all that, right? Oh. Because, but there's certain type of players, right, that get a different rap, like a Dylan Brooks, because he does extra stuff. A dude like Draymond Green, he does extra stuff. Um, what what uh, does Draymond do Richard that's Sherman. extra? Richard Sherman, they, huh? What do they do that's extra? So... Again, this is the fantasy world you have to go off into when you're talking to people who have been placed in positions where they're unqualified and then they just start making things up. And then you have to go off with them into fantasy land. Obviously, the show's now called Speak. Uh, it used to be Speak for Yourself when I hosted it. I know the people that work on the team. You know, Joy, pull up the clips. I've said there's millions of clips, millions of clips, millions of clips. They got a 12 to 15 person support staff that helps them put that show together. Do you know how many clips, if the clips were available, they would have put up on screen to support her narrative? Because, again, it, oh, there's millions of them. Just pull them up. Pull up the clips. With me. No, there's not millions of them. I, I'm going, again, we're off in fantasy. When men do this, no one says anything because we're used to it. There's million, and, and Shady McCoy starts, well, hold on. Dylan Brooks does dumb stuff. Draymond Green does dumb stuff on the court, and they're villains, and they're treated as such. But, but, and she said, well, that's not the same. Okay, well, let me give her a prime example of what someone, should, but, but again, these, you go off into fantasy land. So the entire group, the entire support staff, everybody, the, the, the producers behind, they have to live in the fantasy land that Joy created. And so they all have to sit there and pretend like Johnny Manziel never existed. Anybody remember Johnny Manziel? He's the only thing that comes to mind readily that says, same as Angel Reese. Because she's talking about... You know, we see men do it all the time. They, they, they celebrate. They get in people's face. Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow. What does Joe Burrow do? Smoke a cigar after games? We've never seen Joe Burrow taunting the opponents on the field. You know who we've seen do that? Johnny Manziel. Johnny Manziel used to get in people's faces, do the little money sign and all that. How was Johnny Manziel treated? Did people criticize Johnny Manziel? I think they did. I think I was one of them. But, but remove me. The biggest stars in sports criticized Johnny Manziel. I'm just going to give you two examples. And trust, again, I'm t that show, I used to work there, they got a 12 to 15 person support staff. I, I'm not saying I'm doing all this alone, you know, we got six to eight people in support. But this crew, here's Charles Barkley ripping Johnny Manziel in 2013 for his antics. Johnny Manziel was the villain. Play Charles Barkley. Johnny Manziel, you know what he did? He's doing something that I never thought was possible. He's going to make me root for Alabama this weekend. Johnny Manziel is going to make me. I thought I would never say those words. I am so close to saying roll tide. That's how, Johnny Manziel is annoying me so much. I'm really close to saying roll tide. The, the Auburn people are not going to be happy. They're not going to be happy, but let me tell you something. Johnny Manziel... Oh, my God. The, the only thing saving Johnny Manziel is Miley Cyrus. I mean, are you kidding me? My, that's, the, that's the only thing. People hated Johnny Manziel. Johnny Football. People hated him. Let me give you a, a better example than even Charles Barkley. H have we ever heard Tom Brady criticize anybody? He criticized Johnny Manziel in real time in 2013 when Johnny Manziel had done the exact same kind of things as Angel Reese. Play the clip. 
I get pretty emotional. I have, you know, I have a lot of respect for the teammates, uh, for my teammates, for my organization, and certainly for the other guys in the NFL. There's not a guy who's playing the NFL who hasn't earned the right to be here and who isn't uh, supremely talented. I mean, he's probably been the best athlete uh, in his high school class and his elementary school class. And um, so when you look across the ball, you have respect for those guys and you treat yeah. them with respect because football is a physical game. And if you know, as, as RKK would say, if you're a turd, it's going to come back to you. <laughs> That's Tom Brady talking about Johnny Manziel. Look it up for yourself. If you don't believe me, we just played your clip. He, basically, he called Johnny Manziel, by inference, a turd. No different than uh, the, the, the sports writer, the unknown, nameless, anonymous sports writer or that no one knows anything about called the LSU players, and by inference, uh, Angel Reese, a dirty debutante. Basically, Tom Brady just said, Johnny Manziel, piece of doo-doo. Merrill Hodge and several other people are like, hey, this guy's going to be a bust. He doesn't take the game seriously. He's not the real deal. Johnny Manziel got trashed for talking smack. I'll give Joy an easier one. But, and I hate to go this route because Johnny Manziel's white and, and, and I'll give her an, an even easier one. Before I get to one that would be a distraction, let, let me. Joy Taylor sat opposite, opposite of Baker Mayfield, not Baker Mayfield, of Colin Cowherd as he trashed Baker Mayfield repeatedly for years. Now, and perhaps my memory is, is off. Maybe Christine Leahy was working with uh, uh, Colin Cowherd at that time. But Joy Taylor eventually worked for Colin Cowherd. I don't know the exact timing. But Cowherd's built part of his brand at FS1, trashing Baker Mayfield for being the same kind of a jerk that Angel Reese is. So everybody has to, again, everybody has to move into fantasy land and pretend like, oh no, uh, white athletes, they never get criticized when they do in your face trash talking. No, that never happens. It's all different for a black woman. Oh my God, for black women, it's unbelievable. I don't know how Angel gets out of bed in the morning. No athlete would go through this. This is sexism. This one here is gonna distract. And, and I'm sorry for just mentioning it. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. But do you think people trash Muhammad Ali for being in your face and for bragging too much? You think there weren't a group of people that didn't like that? D d d d that's going to distract because he's black and he's a historical figure. And, but, but again, Deion Sanders, no one criticized Deion Sanders? Oh, it's so different for black women. Oh, my God, what happens to black women? It's unbelievable. You're the most coddled, delusional group of people in America. And I say that, and you'll think, oh, we're like this, hey, black. No, I don't. I want you to course correct your mentality, that victimhood mentality that you're constantly, constantly preaching. It's destroying black people. It's destroying the perception of black people. It's destroying young black men and young black women. It's making us look like clowns. And it's great that you get to profit from making black people look like clowns. Oh, I, I get it. Oh no, Jason, he's the one, he, he criticizes black people. That's what makes us look like clowns. No, it's the clowns that go on TV and defend the clownish, buffoonish behavior of, of a handful of black athletes 
that run out there and defend it. That's who makes us look like clowns. That's who makes us avoid accountability for any and everything. That's who drags black men into looking and sounding like clowns. <clears throat> I'm going to play a clip from uh, someone else here <laughs> that, that pe people won't get and think I'm trying to pick a fight. But if you look at our billboard, our poster, there's a light-skinned black dude at the back of that diary of mad black women. And it's Chris Broussard. And I have very mixed feelings on Chris Broussard. Chris Broussard is uh, someone who is pursuing a relationship with Jesus Christ, and he has been for years. And I respect that about Chris. I, I, I've spent time supporting, participating in Chris's King movement that's uh, directed at black men and, and leadership. I, I have some respect. He's pursuing. He needs to speed up his pursuit because he allows to out racial idolatry to sidetrack him. He, he turns it. This is just my opinion. I, I'm, I'm not trying to, I don't want to denigrate the guy because I'm telling you, I have respect for his faith. But a lot of times he's clueless. It, it, it's no different. He's no different than me. And it, it, it's like when Virgil and, and people that are further along in their journey say, look at Whitlock thinking Mike Todd knows what he's doing. I have to own that and say, you know, I need to elevate, evolve, mature. You know, I, it's part of my journey learning. S someone needs to help Chris learn to remove the racial idolatry and then the pandering to black women. All of this pandering. And again, I know that black women basically require it. And in order to stay in the good graces of the media corporations and, and the feminist movement, you have to pander. But as a believer, as a Christian, we don't have to pander. We shouldn't pander. We shouldn't move off into fantasy land with black women and start pretending like, oh, nobody knows what Angel Reese and these black women go through. They're coddled, and that's the problem. They're undiscipled. They're uncovered. Play Chris Broussard talking about Angel Reese on I First Things First yesterday. Well, it's just very sad that, I mean, winning the national championship should be one of the highlights of her life. And for her to say she hasn't had peace since then, it's just it's just terrible. It's heart wrenching. All right. Um, and we know last year there was a controversy. And that's to me kind of when it began the start her, when there was doing there. this. In right. Front of Caitlin and started. people jumping all over her. Mm. And saying nothing about Caitlin Clark yep. doing it. That was racism. And I think it was classism, too. Because if she was some suburban black girl who was, you know, acted differently, I don't know if it would be as, as people would be on her as much. So criticizing Angel Reese for taunting Caitlin Clark was racism and classism. Again, this is... When they move you off into fantasy land, you start telling lies and manipulating the truth. What, this whole thing that Caitlin Clark did the same thing. No, 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 no. That, that's just not true. It's not factually true. Caitlin Clark, I believe in a Louisville game, in a passing half a second, one second moment, did this. She didn't run up, and I think it was this, that Van Leith or whatever when she was playing for Louisville. She didn't run up on the girl. She didn't, she didn't do it for five, seven seconds, running up and pointing to a ring and all this other stuff. She did it briefly. And it really wasn't directed at any individual. So let's quit the fantasy deal of, well, Caitlin Clark did it, 
and no one said anything about Caitlin Clark. People have said something about Caitlin Clark and the way she behaves on the court. Some people criticized her for that deal against Louisville. Some people this year, including her dad, told her to shut up on the court and leave the officials alone. But overall, Caitlin Clark in no way conducts herself on the court the way that Angel Reese does. It's just a fact. And so if you're not going to be governed by truth and you're going to run off into fantasy land, you're going to sound like an idiot. And you're going to justify the buffoonish, lying, manipulative behavior of these angry black women. And I'm sorry that, that, that it sounds so hard and I, I sound so different because everybody else panders and, oh my God, you, you're the greatest. Everything that comes out of your mouth, the matriarchy and single black mamas, they're carrying the black man and they're carrying the black community. Where are they carrying us to? Straight to hell. Look at our kids. This is not a success story. This is a story about a group of people who have rejected family structure, who have rejected male leadership, and the destruction that's wrought when you do that. That's what this story is. And if you've cracked open a Bible, and I know Chris has, It's all in there. You destroy the family, you destroy everything. And there are repercussions to our kids growing up in this matriarchal culture. And there are repercussions for black women anointing themselves and the culture anointing them as the overseers of black men. I'm sorry, I just, I gotta tell the truth. Last thing here, I want, not the last thing, but I want to bring this up in terms of, of why I think they're going to destroy everything that Caitlin Clark built. And they're already in the process. Because, and this call me sexist, I don't care what you call me, I'm just, I'm just telling the truth here. These uncovered women and their mentality. And, and their willingness to achieve their ends by any means necessary. There's not a lie that they will not tell in order to get what they want. And because men are cowards now and unwilling to stand up to them, we just go along with the lies. And so yesterday I was reading a story about the, the, uh, the director of the women's NCAA tournament, uh, they're going to reimagine or make some changes to the women's tournament format, uh, b building off the success. Yeah, NCAA's women's tournament brass may mold changes this summer. They're going to all try to capitalize off what Caitlin Clark has done. And we're going to change the women's tournament. And within that story, it said a change in format for the first rounds could potentially help avoid logistical problems such as the ones that occurred at the games hosted by Gonzaga in the first two rounds of this year's tournament. A lack of available hotel space forced multiple teams competing in Spokane, Washington to stay more than 30 miles from the Gonzaga campus in someplace in Idaho. I can't pronounce the name of that city. While in Idaho, members of the Utah basketball team were harassed by men flying Confederate flags in their truck and yelling racist slurs. And I said, there it is. This is, this is the Utah story. Uh, the, the Lynn Roberts, I think their head coach. Do we got that clip? Of, of, do we have a clip? Yeah, Utah coach uh, talking about the hate crime uh, that occurred with Utah. Uh, this is a hoax. That Lynn Roberts, the, the white coach at Utah, she's taking a bullet here. She's playing a role. This is a hoax. Listen to Lynn Roberts. You know, the Gonzaga is the host in Spokane, but our team hotel was in Coeur d'Alene. You know, we had 
uh, several instances of um, some kind of racial uh, hate crimes uh, towards our program. And, you know, racism is real and it happens and it's uh, it's awful. And so for our players, whether they are, um, you know, white, black, green, whatever, no one knew how to handle it, you know, um, and it was really upsetting. And for our players and, and staff to not feel safe in an NCAA tournament environment, um, it's messed up. And so we... Uh, moved hotels and you know the NCAA and, and Gonzaga w- worked to get us in a new hotel and we appreciate that um, but yeah that's what happened and it was a distraction and upsetting and um, unfortunate so let me walk you through this and, and, and so a group of women that feel entitled feel like they're mistreated Oh my God, because of the way we, we got to play at Gonzaga. And there are other events going on. I think there was some volleyball deal going on. And, you know, they announced the sites late because it's based on seedings. And so all this is is a group of women. We have to stay at a hotel 30 minutes away from where we're playing. Oh, the horror. Oh, God. And we have to stay in Idaho. And so. They're all sitting there mad and upset and like, how can we get out of this hotel in Idaho? I don't want to stay 30 minutes away and we're in Idaho and and these young black girls don't feel safe. There's Confederate flags and racial slurs. And so just think it through. Let's say they have been playing in Memphis. The black girls and white girls the, the likelihood of them being violated physically, perhaps murdered, thousand times more likely in Memphis than in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. But because we built up this mythical thing like, oh boy, white people are just sitting around waiting for their opportunity to lynch black folks. One of these young Utah girls could have been the next Emmett Till in Idaho. I mean, you know how many black people they kill in Idaho. Ah, we can get a new hotel. We can embarrass the NCAA. We we can force them to change up the format because that's what we want to accomplish. All we need is the right coach and the right team to claim, oh my God, a racial hate crime happened and, and we didn't know how to handle it. There were men in trucks. And they saw a Confederate flag, and oh my God, someone yelled a racial slur. Now, they would go to Memphis, they'd go to New York, they'd go to LA. Anywhere you go, anywhere they stepped outside, there was a good, there'd be a good chance in one of those cities that somebody somewhere would be playing some gangster rap music about killing and no one would bat an eye or say a word. And do you know how much more likely? They are to be killed in Memphis, New York, Chicago, any of these major cities, than Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. They should actually be afraid of Memphis and be like, oh, thank God we stand here in Idaho. Ain't nobody black been killed in Idaho since, you know, 1948. Very unlikely for anything to happen to me in Idaho. Oh, some idiot may drive a truck past me with a flag I don't like and might yell something. I don't buy any of it. It's all a lie. They got this white woman to play a role so they can force these changes and so that ESPN and every, the, the whole movement could write these stories and pretend like, oh, boy, look at this crisis we avoided. You know, no one's ever going to have to stay 30 miles away again. And we got this woman sitting up here doing the same thing as Jussie Smollett doing the same thing as Bubba Wallace, doing this, this is, it's cosplay. It's just a role, it's just an act. And I know this woman's white, but she's a feminist. And she'll do, she'll tell any lie to get what she wants. Go, go, 
I'm going to the big picture, but I don't want to throw another distraction. But go look at the lies they told to get Roe v. Wade established. Anybody ever researched that story? The woman that, that they claimed and one, she was raped by a black men. I mean, it's, it's all just a bogus story. They will tell any lie to accomplish anything that they want. They're going to destroy what Caitlin Clark has built and what women's basketball has built. I know it's not Caitlin Clark alone, but they're going to destroy all this momentum. Because when Caitlin Clark leaves, I'm not watching the WNBA. I love Caitlin Clark, but I'm not going to watch the WNBA because it's filled with mad women, mad feminists, people to think they're entitled, people to think they're a victim. Sports are not about victimhood. They're about champions. They're about people that conquer things. And they've turned this entire thing into the victimhood Olympics. Joy Reid, Jamel Hill, Chris Broussard, Taylor Rooks, Angel Reese. It's a conga line. Lynn Roberts, all of them. It's just mad at the world and over oh, victims. And we had to stay in a hotel 30 miles away. Can you believe it? It's, it's so infuriating because I'm t I've enjoyed this best and I want to enjoy next season. I want to see Juju Watkins grow up and see if she can become the next Caitlin Clark. But all this victimhood, all this whining and crying, all this lying, all this extra drama, it's a total turnoff. This is, they're going to turn this thing into desperate housewives. And I'm going to be out. I'm going to say, hey, it's nice. This is a nice little fleeting thing with Caitlin Clark, but I ain't watching the WNBA. No dice. Too many tats. Too many Britney Griner wannabes. No dice. Too many Megan Rapino wannabes. No way. Don't rate Megan Rapino's husband or wife or whatever. Don't she play in the WNBA? Is she married to Sue Bird or, or Dinah Taurasi? I, I don't Miss me with all of it. This is a one and done situation here. Uh, Caitlin Clark goes, I'm out, everybody else is out, and we'll let all the little angry women fight amongst themselves and, and continue to manipulate simps and get them on board. Uh, said a little bit more than I, than I wanted to. I'm gonna bring Shamika Michelle into the conversation. Uh, before I do that, I wanna talk to you guys about a sponsor, I am so thrilled, so thrilled. I, I literally have said for three years, how come Balance of Nature isn't a sponsor of this show? And now they are. Making sure you have fruits and vegetables in your diet is important for maintaining a healthy diet, but it can also be difficult, especially if you're busy. The average person doesn't even eat half of the recommended servings in a day. That's a huge gap in nutrition and inflation has seriously increased the cost of fruits and vegetables. That's why Balance of Nature provides an on-the-go solution, and they haven't raised their prices for 10 years. Their proprietary blend of 31 fruits and vegetables come in easy-to-swallow capsules and will give your body so much of the nourishment it needs. Imagine trying to eat 31 different kinds of products in a single day. Well, that's what you're getting with Balance of Nature. Fruits and veggies. When you go to balanceofnature.com, you'll get... 35% off plus $10 off any additional sets with your first order as a preferred customer by using my discount code FEARLESS. That's limited to five sets, but you'll save a ton of money while getting the fruits and vegetables you need in your diet. Go to balanceofnature.com and use my promo code FEARLESS for 35% off. That's balanceofnature.com. So glad to have you guys on board. I use the product. My mom uses the product. I called my mother. I was like, Mama, <laughs> about to hook you up with some balance in nature. She's like, oh, man, I need that re-up. So anyway, you can get re-up too as well. Balanceofnature.com. Use my promo code FEARLESS. 35% off. Jamika Michelle, next.
Hello, Fearless Army. I'm Jason Whitlock, your leader. I'm going to spend 2024 discussing growth and sacrifice. Hard times are here. Harder times are coming. What has stopped American growth and caused a regression in fundamental freedoms and values? A lack of sacrifice. Our ancestors sacrificed for our benefit. We have not sacrificed to protect the progress they died for. No sacrifice, no freedom. What impedes man's willingness to sacrifice? His ignorance, his perversion, his pride, his ingratitude, and his cowardice, his rejection of God. The Bible is a story about the power and the necessity of sacrifice. Sacrifice is the sun, rain, and fertilizer of growth. Growth is our life purpose. Grow in the knowledge, wisdom, fear, obedience, and reverence to the Most High. Growth requires sacrifice will be our theme for Roll Call 2.0 this summer, June 1, right back here in Nashville. We're excited to welcome you. Let me spend a minute explaining what G-R-O WTH actually stands for, for us in the Fearless Army. The G is for game plan. In order to properly grow, it's essential we work from the strategic game plan spelled out in the Bible. The R, responsibility. As we grow as men, we understand and accept our responsibilities to God, family, and teammates. The O, ownership. We embrace ownership of our destiny. Outsiders do not determine our fate. The W, wisdom. We honor, value, and share the wisdom imparted to us by elders, coaches, and leaders. The T, trust. We must be worthy of trust. The reliability of a man's word defines him far more than popularity and material possessions. The H, humility. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. That's straight from Proverbs 22 and four. Come join us in Nashville as we talk about growth and sacrifice and how without sacrifice, there will be no growth. Roll Call 2.0 right here in Nashville, Saturday, June 1st. Welcome back, uh, Shamika. I want to bring you into this conversation. I started talking about Taylor Rooks's tweet, where I feel like she is gatekeeping, overseeing the opinion of Emmanuel Acho. I think I see this all the time. Uh, black women think black men need their approval to state an opinion, who to vote for everything, uh, black women are in control of black men and, and black men need to put a stop to it. You, you're, am I reading this the right way? Jason, at this point, black women are America's most unwanted basic bitches. And even the most educated are too dumb to see the error of their ways. It was embarrassing to hear you read that tweet, but also to watch that woman on a panel of men, not even allow them to get a word in edgewise. It's like, this is years of rejection of correction. She wasn't even willing to hear the other side. Like, let's just taste another point of view. Like, mm, Okay, maybe, you know, they they aren't even willing to do this. And this is why you see so many unmarried, because p men are tired of it. Yes, you want to rule everything. And listen, the Bible says, or, you know, we know that iron sharpens iron. Wouldn't you want to be around men who could actually make you a better woman? That would be a smart woman, a smart person across the board would want to be around people who will make them better. But if you aren't willing to listen, if you think that a man is beneath 
beneath you, uh, maybe because he shines shoes, he's beneath you, or he doesn't make the money that you do, he's beneath you. He doesn't have the education that you do, he's beneath you. You're going to miss God-given wisdom that could actually make you a better woman. And this is what we're seeing, and this is why we are seeing women act so crazy and have such poor behavior, because we've told women for decades, you're the smart ones, you're the best ones, you're the backbone. Without you, black people, the black community, a black man is nothing. So this is what we're seeing. I, I obviously I agree with you, but I, I'm so concerned about people, man, they're just generalizing. That's not the majority of black women. And part of me says, nah, it actually is. And it's actually what, from what I, for Joy Taylor, from Taylor Rooks, it's what the media tells them, like, this is how you should behave. And, and so I do think at this point, it is the majority of black women who think this way, that I can make a man better, he can in no way make me better. Yeah, I definitely think it's the majority. If we even just look at how black women think politically, the majority of them are on one side and they are very... Um, they don't, they're not very multidimensional, right? You're going to hear, I don't need a man. You're going to hear, let me shake my ass for attention. That's what you're going to see. You're going to see um, victimhood because the moment somebody tells you that you're wrong, all of a sudden you're crying, you're a victim. I'm a black woman. When that woman, that's all she had to say. She told the men, let's not talk about gender or race, but then said, let's talk about gender or race. You had to make it about Angel Reese being a black woman. I haven't seen a woman with a large platform say, wait a minute, young lady, you are talking about being sexualized, yet you actually put the mold of your vagina in the camera. That's the utmost sexualization. So you have to hold women accountable. And if you don't, this is what we're what we're going to see. Why are why is no one saying that? Why is no one saying but you turn your behind to the camera, but you allude to sex? Most times you're in a picture. We have to actually just call a spade a spade. If it looks like a duck and walk like a duck, it's a duck. If it dresses like a hoe and acts like a hoe, it's a hoe. If you're going to be an unruly woman whose behavior can never be corrected, you're going to be left by yourself to get old by yourself, to get a bunch of cats or dogs because people don't want to be around anyone who's not willing to be open and who is not coachable, teachable, pliable, moldable. And that's where we are today, Jason. That's where we are. And I'm sick of it. The The things that I've seen from Angel Reese, because I don't follow her Instagram, but the things that I've seen since she came out and said she's been sexualized, I'm just thinking, baby girl, you did this to yourself. This is what you wanted. And we're not stupid. Look, if I want to get a man's attention, if we're in a relationship, I know exactly what picture to send him. I'm not dumb. I'm not going to send him a picture with me smiling, looking like I just came from Olin Mills. I'm going to send a picture that's going to make him want to show up and roll up right away. She's not stupid. And this idea that she would say that and, and, and be so unaware of her behavior is silly to me. And we have to hold her accountable. You don't want to be sexualized, stop doing sexual things. Instagram is not the place. Do that in your private phone with the person that you're in a relationship with or shut up. I don't want to hear it because it's it's not genuine, it's dishonest, and it makes you look like a, a liar. So why does it feel like every black woman that has a corporate media platform 
would never correct Angel Reese and would only say it's racism and, and, and you, the things you're saying, they would call you a pick me, that you're just saying that to try to be more attractive to men or whatever. But, but I, 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 there are women like yourself, because I, I obviously I run into them over social media. It, it see, y'all can't get on those platforms or that mentality can't be represented on The View or, you know, has, has the, the View ever had a black woman on that was conservative uh, in, in one of those roles? I, I, I don't think they have. They usually reserve that for a blonde white woman, and that's it. And may, maybe they let a Latino woman pretend that she's conservative, but it, it feels like that whole point of view, that perspective, is off limits for black women. It's definitely off limit because limits because it goes against the code. There's this unsaid code, but it's oozing out. We see it where they stick together and you all have to be saying the same thing. If you aren't, no one wants to hear you. And that whole pick me thing is what they use to try and shut women up that's saying, hey, we need to let men be men. Hey, men were born leaders. God put them to be leaders. They're going to shut you up and they're going to use things like that to get you to be quiet. The thing about me is I've been saying the same thing for 10, 15 years and it hasn't worked. I can't be bullied. And um, yeah, I'll never be on The View probably because, you know, Whoopi is she's not going to have that. And Joy Behar is not going to have that. But this is true. And if we just look at the children, if we look at the fruit of what, um, you know, this type of thinking has has produced, we would change our ways. But if you you aren't willing to take accountability on the small things, of course, you're not going to say, you know, our kids are dying at an alarming rate because we won't take accountability. Women aren't going to do that because it's so much easier to blame the black man. It's so much easier to blame white people opposed to saying, I fell for the tricks of feminism. I was wrong. I would like to change. Send me a black man, God, that's going to help me wash me and present me blemish free. That's what I want. You're not going to find a lot of black women that's willing to say that because it takes too much accountability. And these are the same women that won't even say, I apologize. You know, they'll start lying and crying before there's ever an apology. So I don't think if you can, you can't get them to do it on a small level, on a big level, corporate media. Absolutely not, because you in order to be with corporate media, you have to run with that narrative. And I do feel like it's been a plan from the beginning to destroy the black family, to destroy the black community. And how did they start that? Destroying the black man. And it's it's sad how many women we got to sign up to to go along with it. Thank you, Ms. Jamaica. Uh, great job as always. Uh, you guys hop in the comments, tell us what you think. Uh, I'm going to bring TJ Moe into this fire. <laughs> See if he's got, if he can take this heat. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about it from a different aspect with TJ in terms of like, is what women's basketball has accomplished, women's college basketball, 12 million viewers for that Iowa LSU game might draw 20 million if it's Iowa and South Carolina in the national championship game. Is is this whole thing going to be over as soon as Caitlin Clark exits college basketball? I think so. We'll hear what TJ has to say next. Uh, I'm going to let you do that today. I've said enough things. I talked about I, I mistakenly, and I'm sure I'm going to regret make, making any mention of Kim Mulkey's cans. One of our satellites is falling out of orbit. Which one? It's the one that looks like a pair of... Melons! 
big juicy melons. Are they nice and firm? Now I've mentioned <laughs> Drea. I've had a I've had a wild day here on Fearless. It's time to get buck wild. But uh, yeah. just try to keep it real. Uh, I want to quote you verbatim. Yeah. You can you can cut this out if you want to, but race ten. Brace for impact. Yesterday on the phone verbatim, you said, even I don't have the balls to call out Kim Mulkey's new cans. <laughs> but you did. Well, but yes, you did. I do. <laughs> <laughs>
they're just going to take this precious gift that they've been given and drop it into an ocean of irrelevance that I, I'm just sorry. And someone sent me a message saying, well, you know, then how can you compare her to Michael and Tiger and these other guys if she can't carry the sport the way she can't carry the WNBA the way they did? I'm like, well, hold on, man. The, the, you know, the NBA was already relevant and golf had a level of relevance. They had Jack Nicholas. They had this history, blah, blah. The WNBA has none of that. And again, we can already see they get a little bit of attention and all they can really think about is what I'm owed. And so that's how this connects to this whole Utah thing. I sincerely at this point believe that entire thing is a hoax. It did not happen. They mm -hmm. needed someone. There were three or four other teams that were staying in Idaho that wanted, uh, you know, didn't want to stay in Idaho. And we, we, hey, we need someone to, you know, play the role here and say something happened because all the teams ended up getting moved out of Idaho. People, have, I, I read that in, in in the story that all the teams actually benefited from this uh, race hoax that they they put on people, but. TJ, I don't believe anything happened here. Do, do you agree with me? Oh, yeah. So, certainly, I don't believe there was a second occurrence. It, if there is one, I mean, this is, Mizzou had a, uh, I don't know if you remember 2015, Mizzou had a gay black student body president who said, yeah, this guy came by in a truck and he yelled the N-word and nobody ever had any evidence that that happened at all. Much So maybe people do that. I certainly don't live in a place where anybody does that. Ask Dave Shannon if Idaho is a place where people do that. It doesn't sound like it when you talk to him. And so, yeah, I doubt any of it happened. It certainly didn't happen a second time. And uh, it let's say it did happen. It certainly is not a hate crime. According to their coach, it is. I mean, the, the, labeling this a hate crime when somebody says a mean word to you is the craziest thing I've ever heard. A hate crime. Isn't a hate crime like hanging somebody in the street because of their race or gender, that, that would be a hate crime. Like you committed a crime, you committed murder because of their, um, not saying, Hey, uh, N word. I, 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 so anyway, but this is, this is the problem with, uh, liberal white women, perhaps liberal white women being asked to sit around and talk about race when they have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, so no, I, I, th I think there's no chance that any of that happened at all. I think they're making a monster mistake. The, the, the women's, you know, whoever's running the women's tournament here, is making the mistake of thinking they're the important ones. And okay, we have finally built this thing. No, Caitlin built it and she's leaving next year. And so you think you can move this to a neutral site and anybody's going to show up and watch? The whole reason you had these as home games is so you had built in people to actually watch. So that, hey, you got a 16 team playing a one seed. At least you've got Iowa's fans there. What happens if I was playing in Houston, Texas? You think anybody's showing up to go see that? I said, so they're so out over their skis and they're so arrogant that, you know, that they don't understand. You were making the case just a second ago that, uh, you know, there was a built in audience for golf already because Jack Nicholas and that, you know, you had bird and magic. And so the NBA was growing. You're actually making the case that Caitlin Clark is more transcendent than either one of those people because people actually like watching men play sports. No one likes watching women play sports. Do you know how difficult? of a task it is to get me to look forward to a women's college basketball game all day long and then yell every time somebody makes a three pointer. Cause I was doing that on Monday night, me and my brother, every time Caitlin Clark hit a 30 footer, yeah, every time you know how hard it is to get me to care that women are doing that. You're actually making the case that Caitlin Clark is more transcendent than these other guys. And these stupid women running the tournament are don't understand. And they, they're so arrogant. They think they're the ones who are in charge of building this. You make a great point, and, and it speaks to the, how deep the jealousy is of Caitlin Clark, because it's not just former players. It's not just, uh, uh, it's not just black former players. It, it's, it's everybody that's like, you know how long we've been working and how long we've been building up the women's game, and we made this, and all anybody wants to talk about is Caitlin Clark. And, and now whoever's running the tournament or whatever, yeah, way out over their skis, say, you know what, we're going to change up this whole format and we can now take this game on the road to any major city and everybody's going to show up. 
And I'm like, no, they're not. Because the other thing you're missing out on is like, because of who Caitlin Clark is, a white girl from a two parent home, we can actually crit watch her and, and not have any of this feeling of like, oh, she's a victim. We don't have to feel sorry for her. If there's something we don't like that she does, we can actually criticize it. It's like she's a competitor and we can treat her like we've treated competitors for a long time. People can dislike Iowa. People can dislike Caitlin Clark. And But again, if you don't like Angel Reese, you're a racist. If you don't like Don Staley, you're homophobic. If you don't like any of this crap, that, that, that all the whining and crying, well, you're sexist. If you don't like Lynn Roberts running around pretending like, oh, people melted. Oh, someone said a racist slur and people... It's, 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 I just don't, this whole thing that we as black people are so fragile. And if, oh my God, a white person in Idaho called me a name and I just don't feel safe. And I know I'm a dude and I know that I used to actually be an idiot. But again, I just think back like when I was in college, someone in Muncie, Indiana drove by and shouted the N word. And we jumped out and wanted to fight. We never thought, well, I need to transfer to another school. <laughs> I, I, need, I need to move to a safer neighborhood. I, I, and again, I know these are women. But they're not so dainty. They're not so fragile that, oh, my God, someone called me a name. We got to move hotels. It's a gimmick. And it worked. They're going to, you know, now if someone goes, no one's ever going to have to stay in Idaho again where the chances of something to happen to them is minuscule, mm -hmm. almost non-existent. Nothing goes on in Idaho. Uh, but, you know, maybe, again, I hope they get seated and have to play in uh, Memphis next year and, and <laughs> see how safe they feel in Memphis. Anyway, TJ, uh, thank you. Uh, great job, as always. Appreciate you. Uh, we're going to talk uh, with Anthony and Virgil about Transgender Visibility Day and the 145 days uh, that we've set aside to honor the Alphabet Mafia. That, that's 145, there's only 365 days. Is that, that's nearly a third of the days, uh, you know, we're recognizing the Alphabet Group. Uh, is that too much or not enough? Maybe we should get it up to 50%. Anthony and Virgil, Tennessee Harmony, next. Beef, as I walk you through uh, my top 50 media beefs of all time. Yeah, I'm an equal opportunity beefer. It's like, Randy, are you asleep at the wheel? Big lips are in style. I'd love to squash this beef. I mean, I was not real happy at all. I, I, I was less than thrilled. I was displeased. And now we have beef. All right, welcome back. Time for some Tennessee Harmony. Anthony and Virgil here with us. Anthony, uh, get us started with a prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for your son Jesus that you sent to this world to die on the cross that we may have a right to the tree of life. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, I want to plug Anthony's new book, Identity. Uh, Anthony, where can they get this? It's on Amazon now. Just look up Identity, Anthony Walker is the first thing that pulls out. Uh, I've got a quote on the back of the book. Yes. That's maybe the second or third time I've done that. I appreciate you guys <laughs> asking me for that. Uh, Thank you. Uh, anyway, we're going to talk. No, hold on for a second. First of all, w tell them what the book is about before we. Oh, OK, it's about those who are struggling with identity and those who need to find their identity in Christ. We let everything tell us how we should be identified, our race, our job, our aspirations, but our true identity is found in Christ Jesus. Perfect. Uh, now let's transition. Uh, President Joe Biden 
uh, on Good Friday put out a proclamation that uh, Sunday, March 31st, would be Transgender Day of Visibility. Uh, I guess this event uh, always happens on March 31st. Uh, and so his story is he's just keeping with routine. But he also, Joe Biden, has kind of backed up and said, I didn't do it, which, to be quite honest with you, I think I believe him. I believe that his Twitter feed is run by other people, particularly Corinne Jean-Pierre, his mm -hmm. spokesperson who is part of the Alphabet team. And so th th there's part of that I agree with, but I, I do think that as president uh, and just as a nation, I, I just I wouldn't be making any bold proclamations on Easter other than about Jesus Christ, and particularly if I'm a Catholic like Joe Biden is, I wouldn't be doing that. And then the other part of this is just like Charlie Kirk and uh, who, do, who do we, oh, we had John Amachukwa on this week, and, and he talked, there's 145 days mm -hmm. on the calendar mm -hmm. related to the LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. That's almost half <laughs> Yeah, about half the year. <laughs> and, and so anyway, you all's reaction to Biden's proclamation and just how we've just gone overboard with the LGBTQ holidays. Most people see the heading when they look at the proclamation. But if you actually read it, the bottom of the proclamation, you know, they usually speak in that old English kind of language. And it talks about how this proclamation is being made on March the 29th year of our Lord. And I'm thinking, wow, you tell us in the beginning, this is a day of transgender visibility, but on the day of our Lord, Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say, either we're going to make this the Lord's day and the Lord's year, the Lord's mm -hmm. time and obey him, or it's going to be about you. Um, and then furthermore, you know, you're proclaiming transgender day of visibility. There's no such thing as a transgender. There are only males and females and those who struggle in their identity in the middle. But there is no such thing as a transgender. So to put forth that means that now I have to make Jesus invisible. I have to make his word invisible in order to make transgender be visible. It cannot happen. Uh, and I think it, it probably showed itself on Easter, meaning that all across the world, God's people are declaring Jesus is Lord. Nobody was really paying attention to their visibility. Virgil. Yeah. Aside from what uh, Christians might have felt like was a direct shot kind of aimed at them or aimed at us during our most holy week, you know, we're, we're celebrating the the resurrection of Christ, dealing with the crucifixion on Friday and uh, the, the resurrection on Sunday. Aside from the fact that this was a poorly timed and, and politically calculated move on the part of the Biden administration, the actual Transgender Day proclamation, it reads more, more like a participation in life trophy than, than, it, than it does anything else. I mean, the, the very first sentence opens up and it says, this day celebrates the joy, strength, and absolute courage of some of the bravest people I know. And apparently this is Joe Biden uh, who, who's writing this. And what we have here is, an in, is, an, is a situation where bravery has been dumbed down, right? Uh, years ago during 9-11, uh, during we, we learned of the name uh, Todd Beamer. Beamer was the guy on Flight 93 who, uh, you know, his last words were, let's roll as he and others on the flight were going to take back the plane from terrorists. We called that bravery. Today, mm. we, we, we have a president who's saying that uh, if, if a man has decided to wear a dress and, and prance around like a prepubescent girl for clicks on social media platforms, that that's somehow brave. Uh, we've actually minimized what bravery uh, is, and this day is indicative uh, of it. At, at the at the end of the day, this this proclamation is 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 really you know more of a political ploy uh, than it is anything else. It's not aimed or targeted at at anything other than whoever whoever 
uh, put this out. And Jason, I agree with you. I don't think that he did it. I think his handlers did this. Uh, at the end of the day, I, I think uh, he calculated that evangelical Christians weren't going to be voting for him. And so he needed to rally more people or at least someone on his team felt like they needed to rally more people from the transgender LGBTQIA plus uh, movement uh, to, to stand alongside him. Everything that he does in this year is a, is political. And so he's thinking about it in that light. Right. Right. So my expectations for a 50 year politician and for Biden at this point, you know, his support of abortion and all this other stuff is so low that it's hard for me to get angry. I, I kind of halfway expect this. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like hey, my expectations are so low, so it's hard to disappoint me. But when people used it as an opportunity to point out to me and others, like, man, we've kind of overdosed on this, not kind of, we have overdosed, that 145 days, and you guys go back and scroll up in the prompter. You guys were rolling through some of these crazy days. I think we got a gay uncle uh, awareness day and, you know, bisexual health awareness month, uh, international transgender day, uh, you know, April 6th, asexuality day, the, uh, April, uh, you know, a day of silence, international lesbian visibility day, international day against homophobia and biphobia and transphobia, gender, agender pride day, Harvey milk day, pansexual. And I mean, it just goes on and on and on, and it reminded me uh, a guy named Matt. I'm not going to say Matt's last name, but he sent me a good email that made me think. And this is almost this is way too big for me just to drop in y'all's lap, but I do want a general discussion. We may circle back to it later. But he sent me an email about mystery Babylon, and and says, "Hey, that's what we're living in. That's the time we're living in, and and that." And he's, his argument is like both sides, that all our earthly politicians are all corrupt. And, 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 that, and so I thought about that, what he wrote me, and then I thought, we got 145 days. It, 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 and again, this is a cheap or not a substantive comment, but it is what I feel. It's like, it makes me go, we got to be in end times. <laughs> we, we, I mean, yeah. this is, it, it's got to be close. I mean, yeah, but you know, when you when you see it from God's word, and and I maybe I'm so far on that side that I'm not looking at the threat of this because because it is it is real. We see this displayed in schools. We see it being, you know, focused on our kids. So there is a, a, a thought about that. But I just look at some wisdom that I was given as a kid. God's word, he tells us heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. His word is truth. And what that means is everything physical is going to go, but his word will forever stand. So what that tells us, the wisdom that we can gain about that from truth, truth doesn't need any support. It stands on its own. Now, lies they need all the support they can get. You have to back it up. You need somebody else to help you to believe it. You've got to push out more and more. And, and they, this is what this shows me. They're pushing out so much knowing that it's a lie, but that's the right. only way that it's going to stand. And so in order for the bulk of the world to start believing, we got to know we need to be visible. I see you. And I understand that you're struggling, but, but for me to celebrate that, no, but they have to keep pushing it in order for the lie to gain any steam. But truth in the end is forever going to stand. Everybody that's for all these days and is all this arguing all of this, even if it's transgender, all of them who may identify that way were produced by a male and a female. That's you right. can't even get here without being produced in that way. So that's a truth that will forever stand. And what we have to do as children of God is that we have to keep Telling the truth. Telling the truth shuts down all the lies. Mm, I like that in terms of, yeah, that, that they, they need 104 days, and that's why they may go to 360 days. Yes. That's right. The, the, you know, you got to keep, South keep pushing too much. Yeah, you know, yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah. Virgil, you got anything else here? 
Yeah, yeah. I'll just I'll just simply say I, I totally agree with everything that that both of you men said. And in fact, I, I this day didn't really it, it wasn't even a blip on my radar screen until I actually read the the proclamation. At the end of the day, government has a responsibility to protect the least of these. And as it pertains to children, uh, when when the Biden administration promotes the idea of that that you know states are infringing upon the rights of of children because they're they're trying to ban puberty blockers and and they're trying to say you know no to 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 uh, body dysmorphication you know just just absolutely train wrecking people's body before they're even mentally prepared to understand the choices that they're making uh, I, I think that's a satanic uh, administration that that is a demonic. Uh, administration. And, and we need to do everything we can to remove men and women who think like that from office. Uh, we have a responsibility to step up in the here and now, but I totally agree with Anthony. At the end of the day, uh, truth truth reigns, truth rules, uh, and we we as, as believers in Christ need to stand on the, on the truth of God's word. Gentlemen, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we'll cue up some harmony. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. How did we end up so divided? Stop fighting and stand tall. We used to be a nation, one united. For downfall, God let your light shine down. What we need more than anything now. Harmony. Let's make a simple vow. Let's come together now. Harmony. Put all your weapons down. Love one another now. Harmony. Time for us to wake up. Choose love, my sister, my brother. Tell us.